What would you do if you only had one day left to live? What would you do with those 24 hours? Now think about with this with me for a moment. How, how would you spend that time? What would you do if you woke up tomorrow morning and somehow you found yourself in a situation where you only had one more day? Now, I don't know about you, but my first reaction would probably be to think about all the different places I could go, all the places I, I still want to visit. You know, maybe go to Hawaii or somewhere where there's a nice beach. I think of all the different places I could visit in the world, but even more than that, and my wife can definitely attest to this, I would start to think of all the different things I would want to eat before the day is over. So I would start planning out my meals and, you know, I'm, I'm a bit biased having grown up in Japan. I, I love Japanese food and so I would probably plan out my day with sushi and ramen and, and Japanese barbecue and all these things. And honestly, I might spend a, most of my day just eating, to be honest. The truth is we all have these things that we enjoy doing and, and things that we would like to do in our lifetime. And that's a wonderful thing. God has given us so many awesome things to enjoy in this world around us, but I also know that there's more to life than just pursuing the things that make us happy. There's more to life than getting rich and, and getting a big house. There's one thing that COVID-19 has taught us, it's that, it's that so many of the things that... that that are so valuable to us can be just taken away from us in an instant. You know, my wife and I planned a trip to, to Japan about a year ago to go uh, th this year in April, and it just didn't happen because everything got shut down, and we did not see that coming. But that's the way life is sometimes. Even our careers, our jobs are really only temporary you know, one day we might find ourselves getting promoted and the very next day getting laid off from that same job. The things that we own, the houses that we buy, all these things, they don't last forever. Now, I'd be very fortunate if I lived another 80 years. I hope I do. But even then, eventually, my life will come to an end. And then what? I can't take all my stuff with me. That's just, that's not how it works. The Bible has a lot uh, to, to say to us about the value of time. So today we're going to be reading from the book of Ephesians, which is a letter that was written to the church in Ephesus, which is modern-day Turkey. It was written by a man named Paul. Paul wrote a good bulk of the New Testament that we have today. And this is what he says. He says, Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. So let's start from the beginning of this and kind of unpack this together. I think the message here is quite clear. Paul is saying here, don't live carelessly. Don't just let your life kind of pass by without having given much thought to your decisions. See, if we're not careful, we can kind of allow our lives to go into autopilot mode. We can start to just kind of go with the flow and, and kind of go with what everyone else is doing. So Paul is saying, look carefully. Pay attention. Be wise. When I read this passage, it makes me think of a guard dog. Aren't dogs awesome? How many of you are dog people here? Yeah. If you're watching online, let us know if you're a dog person. My wife and I have a cat, and uh, while she's a gentle cat, 
and, and she's a really a great cat, she's kind of useless because if something were to happen, you know, if someone were to break into our place, she would probably just sleep through the whole thing. Or she, she might even just run away and really, you know, just kind of like, good luck guys, you're on your own. <laughs> Some dogs m might be kind of like that too. They might just like to sleep. But guard dogs, they're always listening. They're always watching. And if, if, if something is a bit off, they can tell. They'll let you know right away. If there's an intruder or a disturbance, they will alert you. In a similar kind of way, Paul is saying here that we need to be on our guard. He says, look carefully how you live. We need to be watching. We need to be listening. We need to be paying attention to where our thoughts are. I want to focus in for a moment on this line right here. Where Paul says, making the best use of the time because the days are evil. This is very interesting. Making the best use of the time. Why? Because the days are evil. When Paul was writing this, these, those were really dark times. Not too different, I think, from how things are now. Our world is, is full of hatred and greed and pride and violence and prejudice and lying and cheating and stealing and murder and so on. The list goes on. You see, when we do something bad, like what the Bible calls sin, why do we do it? None of us plan to mess up our lives. None of us want to be in a messed up relationship. I don't, know, I don't know of a single person who wants to wreck their career or get addicted to drugs or to alcohol. While there are a number of reasons why we end up sliding into these kinds of, of patterns, but I think one of the reasons is because our natural tendency is to slide into these kinds of things. How many of you have had an experience where your kids have come home from school, and I know they're not in school right now, um, but how many of you experience where your kids come home from school and you realize that they've picked up some kind of behavior that you never taught them? All of a sudden, they've picked up a bad word or they learned how to fight, and they just pick these things up naturally. It, it does, it's not forced. It just comes naturally to them. Our natural tendency is to, to do the things that feel good to us, not necessarily the things that are good. You see, Paul was writing this letter to the church in Ephesus where people were just wasting their lives. They were wasting their time and they were, they were incredibly selfish in how they lived. These people were constantly getting drunk, they were greedy, and they were obsessed with doing all sorts of disgusting sexual acts. And Paul is saying to the early Christians here, he's saying, don't be like that. Don't be like them. Don't let those things take you away from the things that are actually important. He says, look carefully then how you walk. Be wise. Be on your guard. Be careful. Don't get sidetracked. The reality is that we all fill our lives with something. So the question then becomes, what are we filling our lives with? See, Paul could see that people in Ephesus were filling themselves with wine. That was how they got by. It's also very common in Paul's day that temple prostitution was, it was a part of their heathen worship. And he keeps warning the early Christians about this. He says, don't be like them. He says, there's something better that we can fill our lives with. We can't undo the things that we've already done, but we can do better in the future with God's help. Research tells us that human beings are creatures of habit. Once we build a habit, it is incredibly difficult to break that habit because it becomes kind of a safe place for us. It's comfortable. It feels safe. And the reality is the only way to actually break that habit is to replace it with a different habit, a good habit. And that's why we usually find it so difficult to, to quit a habit because 
because we've found that place to be so comfortable for so long, it just kind of becomes like our, our home. And it takes a, a long time to start to develop new habits and to replace the old with the new before we can actually be completely rid of that old habit. So Paul says, do not get drunk on wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. He says, be filled with the Spirit. Now, if you're not sure about Christianity yet, and you're sort of still exploring this whole idea of what it means to follow Jesus and to, to invite Jesus into your heart, um, here's what Paul is talking about. When a person decides to invite Jesus into their heart and they sincerely want to turn from their old way of life to a new life with Jesus, then the Holy Spirit comes to live inside of that person. Another couple of names for the Holy Spirit that we see in the Bible are helper or counselor. So the Spirit comes to live inside you, and then what? What does the Spirit do? Well, let's go to the next verse. Paul says, But be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Okay, so let's stop there again for a moment. You can see what's, what's happening here. He says, don't get drunk on wine. Many of you know that getting drunk on wine only brings temporary relief from the pain that we experience. It only brings temporary satisfaction and happiness. But with Jesus, when the Holy Spirit comes to live in you, there's an immense joy that's so far beyond anything in this world. So Paul is saying, be filled instead with the Holy Spirit, instead of filling yourself with wine until you're getting drunk, which really only brings temporary happiness. Why do we sing songs every week? Well, I think there's many reasons, but one of the reasons is just because, because we have so much joy in Jesus that we just can't help but sing. Another reason is because when we sing, the songs actually help us to, to fix our minds on the things above helps us to refocus, it reminds us of who God is and what's truly important. You know, I just can't wait until we can actually sing together here again in this building. It's going to be an amazing celebration. I'm so excited about that. Singing is such an, an important part of, of, of our faith and what, how we express um, our thanks to God. And with that comes... Paul talks about gratitude. You know, doctors and psychologists understand that thankfulness or gratitude is so incredibly important for your overall health. It decreases depression, it lowers your blood pressure, can increase your energy, and they even say that it can help you live longer. You know, a couple of years ago, I really got into Kijiji buy and sell. How many of you are into to buying and selling things? Well, when I first discovered how much money you can save by actually just looking around a bit, I got pretty hooked. And, um, you know, so I started spending hours online just looking at different ads and, and looking for deals uh, for things like tires uh, for my car, for example. And, you know, as you're scrolling through the ads, each ad just kind of... You're, you're scrolling and it's like, whoa, that's, that looks like a good deal. And then you find another one. Oh, that's even better. And after a while, I just, I kind of like, it just kind of started to take up so much of my, my thinking. And, and I started to realize that I was kind of letting it control my thoughts too much. The thrill of finding a deal was just addicting. And um, it got to a point where, where if I found an item, uh, maybe that I had just purchased, and I found it somewhere else and I found a better deal, then I would get angry. And all of a sudden I was angry that, you know, there was this better option out there and I didn't see it. And one day I finally realized I just needed to let go and just be content with what I have. 
there's always something better out there. You know, like there's the, with iPhones, for example, the, the new iPhone comes out and then you, know, you think you've got the latest and the greatest and the very next year there's another iPhone and it's better in every way. It's faster, it's, it's thinner, it's got better battery, all these things. And, and there's just no end. In the last couple of years for me, it's just been this journey of learning how to be content and not, not to allow myself to, to long for the latest and greatest all the time. Just to be content with the things that I have and to say, thank you, God, and to just thank God for them. It's so interesting, but the more that I kind of practice self-control in this area and the more that I allow God into my decisions the more that I express my gratitude to him for the things that I have, the more content and free I actually begin to feel. It's like this weight being lifted off my shoulders. So that's what Paul is talking about here, about gratitude. And then Paul talks about the importance of submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. What does that mean exactly? Well, when Paul uses the word submit here, he's talking about setting aside our own wants the things that we want for ourselves, and fo focusing instead on the needs of others. Instead of looking at all the things we might want uh, to add, the, the next upgrade, or whatever it might be, to start thinking about our neighbors and what they might need. Putting others first. So now that we've kind of unpacked this a little bit, Let's just take a, a few minutes to focus back on this idea of how we can make the best use of our time. Research shows that as of last year, kids that are between the ages of 6 and 12 spend an average of 4 hours and 44 minutes per day looking at a screen of some kind. So that could be a computer, laptop, or a phone, or a tablet, uh, whatever. But that's almost 5 hours per day. Now, if you think that's a, lot of that's a lot of time, here's another stat. The average teenager spend spends an average of seven hours and 22 minutes on a screen per day. That's an average of over seven hours, almost a third of a day. The report also said that those numbers are not including time spent uh, on a device for homework. That's a lot of time. They say time flies when you're having fun. And that's true in a sense. It feels like it, it goes faster, but, but we all know that in reality, time doesn't actually speed up or slow down. It stays the same. And actually, each of us are given 24 hours per day. We all have the same amount of time. So the question becomes, what do we do with it? And before we move on, I just want to kind of give you three uh, tips that I've kind of learned over the years when it comes to managing our time. It's something I've made a lot of mistakes and wasted a lot of time in my life. And these are just three things that I've kind of learned um, that's really helped me and helped me in my decisions and how to, to manage my time. And so number one is to set goals. You know, when I, was, when I was in high school, I, I could pretty easily kind of coast by and, uh, you know, I got pretty good grades and I, was, I did pretty well, even if I didn't set a schedule for myself. But later when I went to college and uh, beyond that, I just, in working, I just started to realize if I didn't set goals in my life, I wasn't going to make it very far. Big goals are so important to have because I think we all need to wrestle with this question of, where do I want to be in five years? And so setting big goals, like a five-year goal, a 10-year goal, these things can help us and plans may change, but they can just kind of act as a guide for us. Little goals, like your goals for the week or, or even for the day, these are so important to just help us stay on track and just to get things done and maximize productivity. So tip number one is to set goals. And number two is to focus on the important things. You know, and this one is difficult because I think we need to have some discernment. Because the things that appear most important to us are not necessarily the things that are most important. I think that most of us, sometimes we dread doing the things that are most important. I remember when I was in Bible college, I would 
get home from school and you know, I'd, get, I'd sit down at my desk, I'm ready to do homework. And all of a sudden, as, as I'm sitting there, I look around my room and all of a sudden I think, wow, maybe I should clean my room. <laughs> all of a sudden, the idea of va vacuuming seems so, so, like so much fun. And I think sometimes we can kind of tend to push aside the important things. Like, I know my homework is important. I know I need to get this done if I want to graduate. But I have this tendency to kind of just push those important things off to the side. And, you know, I could, I could spend hours cleaning or doing other things like that. And so, number two is to focus on the important things. Number three, and this is so, so important, is do not forget to rest regularly. You know, if there's one thing I just want to make really clear today, it, you know, I know that whenever we start talking about time management, there's, it's easy to start feeling guilty or to or feel a sense of, of pressure. Like, should I feel guilty every moment that I'm not doing something productive? Or, or you know, like, what if I want, want to just uh, sit on the couch after a long day of work and put my feet up and watch a movie with my family? Like, do I need to be spending every moment doing something for someone else? And I think that these things, taking time to rest, watching a movie with family, those kind of things are so important for our health. And I would encourage you all to do that. Rest is so important for both our physical health and our spiritual health. We need to be rest in order to be healthy human beings. So spending time with friends, watching a movie, going hiking, having a campfire, all these things are so important for our overall health and God wants us to be healthy individuals. God himself did all his work in six days and rested on the seventh. Rest was God's idea and it is not a waste of time. While we're on the topic of rest, there's been a lot of research done in in the area of, uh, of sleep and sleep patterns and, and how important sleep is um, to our lives. And, and studies tell us that most healthy adults need seven to nine hours of sleep every night. Most people just don't function well when they get less sleep than that. In fact, when we regularly don't get enough sleep, our immune system suffers and it makes it, it, makes it easier for us to get sick. Things like our memory, our reasoning, and just our overall ability to make decisions actually get worse. We become forgetful, and the list goes on. So having said all this, I just want to be really clear. What I'm telling you today is not simply to just do more things. Please don't take what I'm saying to mean that I'm somehow trying to make us all feel like we need to simply do more and to be busier. That really is a religious kind of mindset. Religion says that we need to do more in order to make God happy. And if we don't, somehow, if we don't do good enough, if we don't do enough, then God will be angry with us. And that's not what Jesus is about, and that's not what I'm trying to say. That's not my heart. What I think God wants us to know is how important it is not simply to do things, but to invest our time in the right things. Saying yes to one thing always means saying no to another. Life is kind of like this, this uh, string of decisions and one decision leads to another, which is again why Paul says, be careful how you walk. Be careful how you live. Now this isn't an easy balance being productive and being bold, taking risks, but at the same time, we need to know our limits and remember to rest. Do things that make us feel refreshed. You know, there's times in my life where I didn't think that rest was all that important. And um, uh, there were times when I could just go and go and go, but eventually it caught up to me and I've come to realize that there's actually a direct link between rest and productivity. Although it might sound kind of strange and kind of backwards, we actually function better and make better choices when we're getting the rest that we need. When I was still in Bible college, I clearly remember times where I was writing a paper and, 
and I just hit a wall. And it was like I could not write anymore. I could not work anymore. Just like my brain wasn't working anymore. And then I took a nap. How many of you are nap people? If you're watching online, let us know in the chats how many of you are nap people. Well, once I had rested, I, it was almost like I was given a brand new brain. It's almost like after my nap, it's like I had a completely new mind and all of a sudden it was like I could think again and I could function and I could write. I could process things. Rest is, rest is such a wonderful thing and it's part of the way that God intended for us to live. God wants us to live out of a place of rest. He didn't intend for us to be continually, just constantly running from one thing to the next. There's a book in the Old Testament called the Book of Psalms. This book is a collection of Hebrew poems and songs and prayers. The 90th Psalm is, is a prayer by a man named Moses. Let me read to you a small part of his prayer. He says, Teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. What does Moses mean by this? Teach us to number our days. He doesn't mean to just to count our days, like mathematically to count the numbers and add them up. This also doesn't mean that Moses was asking God to show him how many days he had left, le had left in his life. We can't possibly know how many days we have left. The real meaning here is that God would teach us the true meaning and the value of each day, as if today might be our very last day. That God would help us realize and seriously, deeply consider just how short life actually is. Every day is a gift and filled with new opportunities. And I used to think that if I missed an opportunity today that there would always be tomorrow and I could just start again. But now I'm starting to think I'm not so sure. God's mercies are new every day. He has new opportunities for us daily, but we're not guaranteed a tomorrow. And I think it's so important for us not to dwell on missed opportunities, but rather to focus on the fact that God has new opportunities for us right now and today, and he wants to, to use you today. He has a purpose for you today. How many of you here are risk takers? I'll admit, I, I wouldn't consider myself to, to be a risk taker. I'm just not naturally wired that way. Lately, though, I've been starting to feel like, you know, I, I want to be more of a risk taker. I want to learn to seize the moment. One of my college professors and, and a man that I, I highly respect, his life motto was, spend more moments in the moment. I always thought there was such wisdom in that. You know, Wayne Gretzky said, you miss 100% of the shots you never take. So can I encourage you today, let's take risks. Let's not be afraid to step out and try something new, and maybe you can all help me with that. It was interesting, I was doing some research about the things that people regret the most at the end of their life. And I started to see a pattern as I was researching this. Some people regret not spending more time with their loved ones. Some people wish they had spent less time worrying. Many people wish that they had taken more risks in their lifetime. And I don't know about you, but I don't want to get to the end of my life and, and have all these things that I regret doing or, or not doing. None of us can change the past. And feeling guilty and beating ourselves up about it isn't going to help. But what we can do is to make the right choices now and to begin looking at the future. The amazing thing about God is that he loves to give. We're his kids and he loves to give good gifts to his children. So that's, this is my prayer today, that God would teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Help, that he would help us realize just how precious each moment is and how much each moment is worth and to help us make the right decisions. 
You know, all the best stories have heroes in them that give up their life for the good of others. Think of your favorite childhood story. You know, when I was a kid, I loved the Narnia books. I loved, I, even now, I, I love Lord of the Rings. And all those stories, they have, they have that, those characters that sacrifice their life for the good of others. Jesus came to this earth 2,000 years ago, and what he did for us was far more profound than I think we'll ever fully understand. Pete Scazzaro, who's the founder of Emotionally Healthy Discipleship, he put it this way. He said, Jesus lived the life we should have lived, and he died the death we should have died. His life was completely selfless. And his death, he, he died for us so that we could be free from guilt and from shame, from all of the bad stuff that we've ever done. He died for each one of us fully knowing that we would somehow, at some point in our lives, that we would screw up. Not only did Jesus die for us, but he died a brutal death. You know, if you've never read about the life of Jesus before, I, I encourage you to pick up a Bible and to read the book of John. I, it will change your life. God has a plan for your life, and his plan will bring you great joy. That doesn't mean that when you put your trust in Jesus that automatically, all of a sudden, all your problems go away and all your pain will just magically disappear. But it does mean that he will be with you no matter what happens. Jesus is coming back soon. Jesus could come back in my lifetime. Or I might live till I'm 100 and something if I'm lucky. Either way, the question that I need to wrestle with right now is am I living in a way that I would have no regrets? Am I using my time to do things that will have eternal, lasting impact? Now, as you think about the things that we've kind of been talking about today, you might be thinking to yourself, but Pastor Johan, my life is so messed up. It's such a mess. I don't know if I could ever turn it around and, and live healthy like that. Some of you are struggling with addictions. For some of you, it might be alcohol or drugs or porn or television or video games. Or you're caught, maybe you're caught in a, in a cycle of unhealthy relationships. We've all got stuff. Some of you are, are struggling with fear of failure and you find it difficult to take risks like me. Like maybe you're, you're not a risk taker and... and, and and you just, you, you need courage. Some of you might, feeling like, might be feeling like you can't rest and you've just been working and working and working seven days a week nonstop and you just, rest hasn't been a part of your life. You've almost forgotten what it's like to take a break. And if, if that's you today, I'm here to tell you right now that, that you're not the only one and that there's hope. It doesn't matter how messed up your life is. There's always hope to turn it around and to start living right now with a sense of purpose and confidence and joy. God loves you and he wants to be involved in your life. He has a purpose for your life that's far better than anything we can come up with on our own. So if you're not sure that, that you can put your trust in Jesus and ask him to come into your life because because you feel like your life's just too messed up today. Don't let that hold you back. Jesus cares about you so deeply. And he wants to be involved in your life. His arms are wide open. The door is wide open for anyone. Or maybe you've been a follower of Jesus for, for a long time and and maybe you feel like there's certain priorities in your life right now that you kind of want to readjust. Maybe you feel like resting hasn't been a normal part of your life. Or maybe, like me, you're just, you're not a risk taker and you want God to give you courage to move forward and to take more chances. Wherever you find yourself today, I believe that there's something that God wants to speak to each of us. So let's pray together and 
and let's just let the Holy Spirit speak to us about what, what he wants to say about how we spend our time. Father, we thank you for teaching us about the value of time. Lord, we, we realize that we're not guaranteed tomorrow. So we ask that you would give each of us, Lord, give me wisdom, how to live my life well in light of eternity. I pray for each one of us today that you would give us strength to do the right thing. Help us to, to use well this gift of time that you've so graciously given to us. Lord, I pray that you would help us to be healthy in how we live our lives. And thank you, Jesus, that your arms are open wide right now for anyone who wants to come to you. Lord, that, that the door is wide open. Lord, I just pray, I invite you once again into my life, Lord. Help me to be better. Please come and make us healthy people, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.